Good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to our meeting in public of the Mid Yorkshire Hospitals NHS Trust Board? A warm welcome to you all. Um, we're going to begin as we have done for the past few months and we'll continue to do with a clinical story. I'm delighted to welcome Paddy Blacksill and Graham Smith, our two heads of clinical service for respiratory um, of this area, which is great importance to trust all time, but more recently during the, the pandemic. So I'm going to hand over to Parry, I think who's going to lead off. He'll be joined by Graham. Um, over to you both. Ah, you're both in the same picture now, are you? Ah, there's Graham. Right. Good morning. Morning. So I'm Parry Blackson. I'm going to be doing the presentation, but I'm hoping that you're going to direct any questions to Graham. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to really just give a story of our journey over the last six to eight months, um, rather than having lots of slides. Um, but in order to do so, I thought we need to start off um, really with where we were before COVID started. So, um, if I could move to the first slide, please. Which is the next one, which is where we were at the end of last year, where we were in a position where um, we'd gone through the winter and we thought we were doing really quite well. Um, our RTT position was over 90% and we'd maintained this throughout the winter period, which is quite challenging for respiratory because that's usually our most challenging time. We'd done this despite several gaps in our rotor with consultant vacancies due to retirement and consultants leaving the trust. And we were working extra hard to achieve this and we were really quite proud of ourselves. We had managed to recruit three new consultants into posts and this was an achievement in its own right because it was at a time where lots of um, trusts were finding it difficult to recruit. Um, and these were all consultants who had worked as registrars within our trust and it showed that they wanted to come back and work with us and we were really quite proud of that. Um, on a different note, we were working well with um, the Cancer Alliance in providing lung health checks um, in terms of looking for lung cancer and screening effectively for lung cancer. Um, and this was despite lots of challenges we had and close working that we had to do with um, radiology colleagues who had their own significant workforce problems. Um, we were developing lots of services which were improved and safer, such as our plural disease services, which were um, increasingly being done in a safe way in an outpatient setting. We already had well established um, NIV and sleep services, and these were going well in their RTT position was um, equally good, if not better than the whole of respiratory put together. And we were having we had plans to reopen to um, outside um, trusts for sleep services um, and again help neighbouring trusts um, where we were able to. So um, doesn't mean to say we didn't have any challenges though and if I could have the next slide. Um, we did have some significant challenges and um, the most significant of which I thought was the junior doctor GMC feedback survey which um, we had a lot of work to do to um, address the issues raised by our junior doctors. Um, we had HEE vis visits, which made many recommendations, amongst which was our huge bed base, much larger compared to neighbouring trusts, um, which meant that we weren't able to always be there consistently and effectively for our junior doctors in a way that they felt um, was required and especially this was not always, um, we were not always present during morning ward rounds and they didn't always know who to go to um, in the senior team where they needed to refer for help. So these were issues which we were trying to address um, and this was at a time where our own workforce in the consultant um, arena was reduced and there was worker fatigue throughout. 
not just in the consultant workforce, but also in our nursing um, teams. Um, we had trouble retaining experienced nursing staff, both in the nursing and respiratory physiology teams. We did have um, PAs assigned to us and we had prescribing pharmacists, which did help. And we were training AMPs, which we were hoping to develop um, business cases for to retain them and have them function within the team again to improve our services and improve the junior doctor experience. We had our old challenges which um, kept coming up and this was um, one of them was providing what we knew was a really good service, the in-reach service, which we were providing together with our respiratory nursing teams. Um, but this had changed with AHR and we were trying to provide it into multiple admission areas, which was challenging at times. And not only that, being recognised for the work we were doing and having it captured was not always um, the case. And we found it challenging to show that we were doing the work that we were doing because many times the work was actually recorded under general medicine rather than respiratory medicine. And then, so this brought us to sort of late February, early March. I had a really nice holiday and I came back to the next slide, please. <laughs> and it was like um, I knew it was going to happen. Obviously, we all knew it was going to happen because we knew what was going on in Italy and we knew it had come to London. But it, it was a really sharp awakening after my holiday and it was a new way of working like I'd never known before. And I'm sure many of you will recognise that. And it really involved a lot of planning and very quick planning. So if I could have the next slide, please. And what we did was transform the way we did things and we did it by establishing the command and control structure. And it felt like endless meetings where we had to plan things quite rightly and um, change the way we worked completely and relay this to all our colleagues so that they knew where they were. We had to clo work very closely with our managerial teams and with other specialities. And we did this really well because we spent so much time together, admittedly in close proximity, which would bring shivers to everyone's um, if they knew what their ICP um, performance was at that time. But nevertheless, we did it and we developed surge plans. And we worked closely with colleagues at the time, we thought that um, intensive care were going to need most of the beds in the hospital and surge plans were developed in close liaison with the, with the intensive care colleagues. We gave up our acute respiratory care unit to them when we had to relocate to gate 31. And this in itself required a huge amount of planning because it wasn't just a case of moving we had to plan it carefully in terms of both IPC and in terms of having to learn about the oxygen supplies in the hospital, which was a feat in itself um, because we needed to know exactly how much oxygen we could give to our patients at any one time and with what ventilator device and planning all of that, our ventilators and the consumables that went along with it was a, was a really big task. Nevertheless, we did it. We did that. Um, at the same time as reconfigurating the way the entire hospital bed base looked. We had to redesign all our rotors and work completely differently. We were working with um, colleagues that we had never worked before. And during the whole of this time, we were running on adrenaline as the whole hospital was and everyone was really eager to help. Everyone was um, <coughs> doing things that they hadn't done before. We were all learning as we went on and we were helping each other and it was a good experience in many ways. Um, we did have to keep relearning things and updating as we went along. For example, we learned fairly quickly that invasive ventilation wasn't the best way to manage our patients and we had to go back and reclaim our bed base and increase our bed base um, to two areas at one stage, reclaiming our respiratory care unit that we'd given up and using gate 31 and developing increasing surge plans as we went along. And we were doing this with endless new guidelines coming along as 
evidence emerged as how to best manage our patients and we're trying to educate ourselves and educate our colleagues along the way. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So as I said, at first we did this by working closely together in meetings that would not be allowed now. Um, and we, if I could just have the next slide, we thought COVID, we communicated COVID, everything was about COVID. We went home and our family asked us about COVID and it, I dreamt about COVID. Um, we were working in quite challenging ways and we did it because we had to and it, we were being recognised for it, especially on Thursdays at eight o'clock. Um, and we just did what we had to do. But there were a few really difficult weeks during that time where it felt like we were just losing our patients left, right and centre. What kept us going was the really positive feedback that we had. But there were times that were quite horrific, really. And I think what kept me going was some moments where I watched some of our nurses and from healthcare workers to our most senior nurses giving the most amazing care to our patients in such difficult times when the patients were so frightened and didn't have their loved ones around them. It was really moving and I tell you um, our nurses deserve medals for that. If I could have the next slide please. So during the early days we developed really good relationships with our colleagues and that was in part because we were working in environments that would now be illegal and now we're working like this which is good and it works but it's only because we've built those ties and trusts within our teams and we can work effectively now more remotely um, but it is a new way of working and there are challenges associated with it. Um, and if I can have the next slide, please. So as we went through lockdown and COVID numbers reduced, our old punters were knocking on our doors again, um, attendances to emergency care departments increased, and we were challenged with reset because now, we need to provide the same activity as we did pre-COVID, but really we're not living in a world that is pre-COVID. Everything is different and managing our patients is so much so different. There's this concept of time for me that it feels like we have to deliver the same activity, but we're working at a completely different pace. Everything takes longer when it comes to PPE, um, working in a social distanced way with our colleagues at the same time trying to teach our colleagues and keep the training going um, and building um, clinics in a way that didn't exist before, working with new rotors that didn't exist before and trying to micromanage things so that we have the right number of patients in clinics that are um, socially distanced, that we have the right number of video consultations together with face-to-face -face consultations and telephone consultations. All that takes so much planning, planning that we didn't have to do before, planning that takes time. And we're developing new ways of the referral so that we don't work in the same ways. And that again takes a huge amount of planning. Not only that, We've got new work because we are tasked with providing care for patients post COVID. Now, admittedly, many of the problems that patients have following COVID are not directly respiratory related, but there, there is a large group of people who will have problems respiratory related secondary to COVID and we need to look after them. A couple of months ago now, the British Thoracic Society, amongst with other societies, provided guidance of how to manage these patients. And it's a huge amount of work, work that we need to do in close partnership with our diagnostic colleagues, colleagues in radiology and primary care colleagues so that we can manage this work that is coming our way. We are um, doing this at the same time as planning for a second spike and winter pressures and it's a challenge. 
and we went through COVID and that was a challenge, but this to me seems like a, a far bigger challenge and it requires a huge amount of planning. <coughs> so if I could have the next slide, please. Um, really to summarise, the key things for me have been team working and building relationships and partnerships with colleagues, learning how to manage COVID patients and if there is a second spike, managing them better. There is evidence that um, later during the pandemic, survival has improved for COVID patients. And I think there's a lot of learning and new treatments that have gone on that we need to um, incorporate in, in new ways of working should there be a second surge, together with managing the chronic respiratory disease that COVID has unfortunately brought us. We've got to do this whilst keeping in mind training for the future workforce, and that should be the centre of our focus and remain the centre throughout all this. We need to communicate well with our colleagues within and without the trust and manage expectations. And if I can have a summary of it in one final slide to show you what I think of the respiratory team, this is what I think of our respiratory team. And I'll open you to questions um, to Graham please. That's Hi. Great us, really. Hi thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm sorry my computer's frozen halfway through so apologies for that but it'll be back shortly. Um, so you've seen a very distant picture of me. So Paddy thank you uh, to you and Graham and to the respiratory teams for all you've done during recent times and at all times because I think the team has shown tremendous resilience. Um, I shall open it up to questions from any of my colleagues um, and I'm not sure anybody wants to come forward with any questions or points. Oh, Gary, Gary Ellis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th 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 thanks, thanks, Barry, for that. That was, uh, uh, it's, it's an area of disease is an area that I'm uh, really interested in for lots of reasons to do with the type of community where we, we were actually active in. I suppose the, the question is, you mentioned uh, video versus face-to-face -face consultations. I suppose my question is around, you know, respiratory disease is often seen as a, as a lifestyle choice to a degree. Uh, not that I necessarily agree with that, but that, that, that's how some people see it. Uh, and sometimes that means some members of the community um, probably really need access to that service, but at, at the least IT capable of doing that. So how have we ensured that people haven't, haven't dropped between two stools there where we, we know face-to-face -face consultations, capacity has been more limited. And the video is a great option, but it's, it's a great option for those that have the capability to use it. So um, that, you're, you're right, that, that's been a very big challenge with the video consultations um, and excluding some of those people who, for social reasons can't, can't access that. And we're very conscious of that and we've been exploring with CCG colleagues uh, um, options for whether perhaps some, some, some charitable organisations can help with temporary Wi-Fi uh, to facilitate not having to come up to the hospital. But it, inevitably, um, it, it's been a very large challenge for us because telephone consultations we've found in, in many settings are just very much a second best. Um, and so I think there are still those patients who will need to visit the hospital estate um, uh, with, with the challenges that that brings with social distancing. Um, but we are trying very hard to try to not disadvantage people for technical technological reasons. Okay. Any other points anybody wishes to bring up? Um, to Martin, Martin Barclay. Um, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you both very much indeed. Um, uh, two questions, if I may. Um, one is based on your experience um, with, with handling COVID, what, what did, if, if there is a second spike? or surge um, and the winter. What, what are the sort of top two or three lessons that we need to carry forward um, for next time, do you think? And the second question is, how do you, you know, what, what are the staff feeling like at the moment? Okay, so um, I think the biggest 
learning point and message going forward for any potential second spike was alluded to by Parry in, in the presentation. Uh, we all believed nationally that COVID would be a problem for intensive care and that, that we would need you know, up to upwards of 100 intensive care beds to invasively ventilate people. I think we've learned that lesson uh, very well and now know that it needs to be non-invasive ventilation. Uh, yeah. um, so I, I think we, we've taken that on board and our surge planning for second spike as 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 taking that into account. So that's probably the, the first lesson for going forward. Um, the, the other challenges we face is should there be a flu uh, epidemic at the same time, uh, then that that will be an enormous challenge that yeah. I could could well, well, I, I hesitate to yeah. say break, it will be very challenging should that happen. But we're yeah. hopeful the lessons from the Southern Hemisphere are that there doesn't appear to have been as much flu there in, in, in this year and hopefully that will carry forward for us. Um, social isolation was was a, uh, uh, sorry, not social isolation, um, uh, social distancing and, and, and lockdown had a remarkable effect on our traditional respiratory patients um, and we didn't see many of our regular visitors and we think that's not just through fear of visiting us, we think they possibly, because they stayed at home, didn't get exposed to the traditional wind, sort of traditional pathogens and again hopefully that will, will enable us to get through winter at the same time. But um, yeah, I, I think planning for critical care capacity and it's it's the downstream planning to get patients out and working with partners. Um, do you remember right at the start of COVID we, we managed to empty the hospital within a, a week to, to make space for everyone and I think that sort of planning to, to <laughs> discharge people that, uh, to, to partner organisations will be invaluable for winter. Um, I've forgotten your second question, Martin. Um, how, how, how do you think staff are feeling, the morale side of things? And is there anything that the Trust Board can do to, you know, support staff in ways that we're not, that are not currently available? So I think we've been very, very aware of staff morale. Um, certainly the, the, um, the, the, the sudden move to, to Gate 31, where we had to combine our staff with cardiology staff that we weren't familiar with uh, brought lessons. Uh, we, we put on um, support sessions for those staff and I hope that the staff are in a, a better place now. You'll all be acutely aware of, of the uh, outbreak on gates 45 and the, the cluster on gate 27 which brought with it quite a lot of challenges with morale but I hope the team are bearing up. Um, and all I can really suggest uh, is that, that we keep a very close check on, on the morale and yeah. seek your support should it become more of a problem. But I, I think you're very right to highlight that and should we face the same, a second spike again, potentially a worse one with winter pressures, that, that is probably, probably a, we probably should have highlighted that more in, in our presentation. So you're very right to, to ask about that. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, David Russell. <coughs> thanks, Chair. Um, thanks for that really interesting presentation. I wanted to pick up something you mentioned about um, the chronic respiratory disease that you're now seeing as a late consequence. And, and I suppose in the context of, of the more generic post-COVID sy syndrome that we're hearing a lot about, what's your sense of the extent of the burden that that's going to impose longer term? And, and is the evidence that that is something that gradually improves or is it truly a chronic disease which the worst sufferers may never actually recover from? I don't think we know the full answer to, to how how long lasting the symptoms will be because we're still only sort of six months in um, and in terms of quantifying that again this feels a bit like a cop-out but because because we've been turned off to routine referrals. We've been a little bit protected to that. And I don't know the true size of the problem. Um, colleagues in Bradford who have launched their post COVID um, clinics uh, a little earlier have noticed, however, significant numbers of, of non-respiratory chronic fatigue type symptoms. And I think within respiratory alone, we won't be able to deal with that demand. Um, 
and so I think we're going to need uh, support from other services, pulmonary rehabilitation, for instance, um, and, and we'll have to factor all of that into our post-COVID things. We're very worried that the, the problem will be large, and I think it's a big challenge because should there be a second spike and we're doing less uh, planned care, then that that's a, potentially a large group of patients that might then miss out again. Uh, and in terms of the, the, the more generic post-COVID syndrome, that seems to be following illnesses which were sometimes quite mild. Presumably that's not necessarily the case with the respiratory complications, which presumably are more pronounced in those who've had a more acute respiratory presentation. Is that the, is that the general yeah, feeling? Yeah. That's, that's very much what, what, we, what we feel. Um, those who've been critically unwell are those that are most at risk of the respiratory complications, so who've had significant lung in inflammation, who will then go on to get the chronic fibrotic thing that uh, changes that, that as a respiratory department we feel will be best uh, suited to, to help. Um, so we are proposing uh, when we, we start our non-COVID follow-up um, services, uh, sorry our post-COVID follow-up services, that we're going to target those groups who have been critically unwell through intensive care and, uh, and, and, uh, and RQ. Um, because we feel that those are the highest risk patients. Good, thank you. Hello. We've lost video at the moment, so apologies if you can't see us, or, or okay. congratulations if you can't see well, us. Well, we can see you. For some reason, we can definitely see you in the boardroom here, and I think others can. I think, Leno, you wanted to raise a point. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to thank you for the presentation, and I think you, your talk about how staff have worked together, we consistently hear that um, and it moves me every time I hear it. I wanted to ask about the changes you experienced in supporting patients and their experience, particularly during the pressured time. It'd be quite useful to hear about the learning and the changes from the patient perspective. Um, I think one of the things that was really striking was the fact that patients were alone and they relied on support from the nursing teams and where that was apparent it was really heartwarming um, and we were and the fact that we were constantly phoning the relatives and how hard that was and um, to be honest with you is i think it is something that will have long-term effects on our staff because inevitably they it's not the same as having your family, no matter how hard they try. And I think our staff felt it and the patients knew it. Um, <clears throat> the patients that we lost, obviously, they're going to not have had their family around them. The family are aware of it. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's something that we have to all learn to live with. It was most definitely not ideal. I, I'd just like to send congratulations to, to the family liaison team who supported us greatly and I don't think we would have got through without their support and uh, and, and they certainly the, the provision of iPads for distressed relatives who couldn't visit the hospital that that really was very very helpful but inevitably as Parry says it's not the same and will have lasting effects on on the families who lost loved ones and for the, the nurses who, who cared for them during that time. Thank you. That's an important reminder of those things um, that we will need to continue to do. Thanks. I haven't got any other questions of that. So can I say an enormous thank you to both of you and through you to your teams? And, and if you'd like to mention, Andrea, there's a whole range of, of um, partners, stakeholders and staff and volunteers who've been involved in this whole effort. So can you pass on our thanks to them? Um, it's been a real effort and we just hope that some of the things that you sort of hopefully won't be happening this autumn, things that you talked about we won't happen this autumn and that the good news coming out of uh, the southern hemisphere regarding the flu epidemic might well continue and that, that won't happen here. So thank you to you both and uh, I hope you have a good day the rest of the day. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're perfectly happy to stay and watch the meeting in public if you'd like, but you may have more important things, better things to do, I don't know. But thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, we're going to move on now to our meeting in public. We have no questions from in advance from any members of the public and haven't been made aware of any questions which 
are waiting for me to um, recruit to members of the board um, or the executive team. So just so we remember about the, the sort of rules and regulations of this, we are following government guidelines to keep staff safe and members of the public safe. And as such, we are meeting virtually um, and are likely to have to do so for the foreseeable future. This meeting is being facilitated by Microsoft Teams Live and is the first time it reviews this format for a meeting in public. We don't envisage any problems, but please bear in mind with that. Please bear with us if there's any issues. Uh, Mark Braden is kindly hosting the meeting for us. Um, and as I say, there are, there are no questions in, in advance. I just want to say one of two things before I move into the formal part of the meeting. Um, yesterday was Emergency Services Day. This week is Organ Donation Week. These are really important occasions and we should celebrate um, and give thanks to all people who are involved in these uh, initiatives. Uh, all our partners and stakeholders working with us across the emergency services are vital for the trust and for our patients and for local residents. I think our organ donation week has been very successful this week, both in Wakeford and North Kirklees. And for Wakeford residents, I think there's been a flag flying at top Wakefield Town Hall, which was organised by um, members of the organ donation committee here together with colleagues at Wakefield Council. So thanks to them for that. <coughs> Similarly, I think there's been a flag flying at Dewsbury District Hospital this week. It's also Lenore Ogilvie's last um, public uh, formal board meeting. So my thanks to Lenore for that. I will say more to say on that towards the end of the meeting, but um, she will be departing for Canada um, within the next uh, week or so, but she will be attending the seminar virtually on the 24th of September. And remember, it's eight hours behind, so enormous thanks to Lenore for getting up and then godly hour. I think of about four o'clock in the morning in British Columbia to do that. But um, we'll say more about Lenore's um, last meeting later on. Um, <clears throat> I have no apologies for absence. I'm not aware of any. The meeting is quiet. There are no new declarations declared by anybody on the declarations of interest register. But can I just say, if you do have any declarations of interest as they change, would you please communicate with the Governance and Secretariat regarding changing your uh, entry on register? Um, we have the attendance matrix here as well, and this has been uh, noted. So we're now, ladies and gentlemen, to 1.5, which is meeting of the public, the trust, public trust board, which is held virtually on the 9th of July. I've been made aware, this is the minutes of this meeting have been circulated previously, um, and I've been made aware of one or two changes which people have asked to be made, and I think that's been circulated amongst members of the board. So therefore, um, are people happy to receive these minutes as a true record of our meeting? Thank you very much. We then also have the unconfirmed minute of the annual general meeting, which was held on the 16th of July. People are happy that these represent the true record of the meeting also. I'm not aware of any dissent. So thank you very much. We will sign these as accurate. Um, matters arising from the meeting on the 9th of July, um, we have two actions from Dr. Karen Stone, which I think is updated in the meeting. Is that correct, Sue? Yes. So if you look on Karen, um, Trust Board Scorecard and the Maternity Incentive Scheme, do you want to give a brief answer to both of those? Trust Board Scorecard, Simon, uh, Simon who raised the question, Simon and I have discussed it and we're content that that is resolved. And the second one, um, I circulated to board members a few slides that demonstrate the um, trainee satisfaction survey for our OBS and gynae trainees. Thank you very much. And then we want to item 1.7, which is the Chair's overview. So this report records the activity from July through to uh, yesterday. <coughs> if you have a flavor of some of the stuff that I've been involved in. I want to just mention two other things which aren't here. But I did receive two letters over the past couple of months from the Lord Lieutenant of West Yorkshire, Ed Anderson, regarding the gold award we received for work with military reservists. 
and also a thank you from him on behalf of the community, I think, for all the work that we've been doing as a trust during the pandemic, which were a great delight to receive. Um, so I've replied to Ed and thanked him for both of those comments and, and obviously passed on the thanks of uh, particularly around to the Gold Award for what the military reserves and all the work that certain people within the Trust have been involved in there. I also wrote uh, this week to Merrin McRae, the Chief Executive of Wakefield Council, on behalf of the Trust to thank her for her work in partnership with us and to wish her well in, on her impending early retirement. So Merrin, I think, leaves the Council towards the end of this month. Um, I'm bored to ask to know the content of this report. Anybody any questions? No? Thank you very much. We'll now move on to item 1.8, which is the Chief Executive Report. Martin. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, the Chairman's already mentioned about the Trust receiving the Gold Award, and uh, I think the Board should note the positive leadership provided by um, Ellie Valentine uh, on this programme of work. The My Star Awards and Teams of the Week are self-explanatory. Um, it's interesting to note the um, information sharing agreement between the Getting It Right First Time uh, program and the Care Quality Commission. And I think this is all part of the uh, CQC's evolving strategy for more evidence-based assessments of trusts as opposed to um, the, the massive scale of on-site inspections which um, they <clears throat> have signalled they're moving away from to a more targeted plus evidence-based uh, approach as I mentioned. Um, since our last uh, board meeting we've had a meeting of the Trust Digital Programme Board and sort of the key points that arose from that uh, in that board meeting are in the report. And um, I'm happy to take any questions uh, if there are any. I'm not picking any up in the chat and I don't see anybody's hand up. Anybody, any questions for uh, Chief? Keith, you can't put your hand up. Keith, it's Stephen Rand for speaking. There's no ability to raise a hand on the system at the moment. I hope you could put a question mark in the chat, Stephen, which is what a couple of members have done previously. Okay. Do you have a question you want to raise? Sorry, Stephen, did you want to raise? Yes, yeah, sorry, I did actually. <laughs> um, just wanted to ask a question regarding the um, well, Martin's report, which is the um, major threat was identified by the trust. Uh, it's the very last paragraph, actually. Yeah, under security. Under security. Yeah, that's it. I'm just. Uh, Sorry. No. Yeah, I just found it. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, what was a specific question? Yeah, it was what was the major threat was identified without saying what the threat was. I was just curious as to what the threat was that we're talking about, Mon. I, I, in all honesty, I can't remember. Um, so, Mark okay. or, or Simon, um, your memories might be better than mine as to uh, what was said at the uh, programme board meeting. I'm sorry, Martin, I wasn't actually at that meeting. Oh no, of course not. Simon Stone, do you remember? I'm just, uh, I, I believe it was a, an urgent hatch because there was a uh, notified of a, they, they, um, they picked up a warning that there was a, 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 uh, a breach in the, in the um, I, I can't even remember the words now, but they had to <laughs> patch all servers very urgently to prevent something from actually uh, intruding. Okay. Okay. Well, yes. whatever it is, it's fixed now, right? Okay. It, 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 it is. Anyway, thank you, Simon, for uh, stepping in, it's reducing my embarrassment. Thank if people, you. Uh, just to remind people, and Steve makes a good point about putting a hand up, I don't think you can. But if you do have a point, can you put a question mark in the chat and I will pick it up from there? Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, so that concludes Jimmy's Zex report. We will now move on to discuss True North. Yeah. So obviously this contains more detail on our breakthrough project. Yes, yeah, so this, this is the um, first um, True North report the board's received uh, for this um, planning year and financial year. And I will just uh, talk through um, that a bit. Um, I'm going to start uh, with um, page seven, which is a sort of a null page because um, the patient FFT uh, initiative has uh, been halted because of the COVID pandemic, and that is a national decision. Um, and although nationally the staff, friends and family test um, was halted, we did go ahead with it. And as you'll see on this, um, we, we had a, our best ever uh, feedback from staff, both about recommending the trust as a place for care and as a place to work. And, um, and indeed, uh, staff have just been surveyed uh, for quarter two. Uh, so we, we will see uh, what the results are in that um, survey. We then move on to the timely decision to admit, which is um, which has improved in July, uh, but, but I anticipate a pretty serious reduction in August um, because uh, we, we've had significant bed problems caused by a variety of issues. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the July performance was one of the best months we've ever had on that. The medically optimised for discharge um, patient numbers are, you know, typically almost double what our ambition is and this remains an absolutely vital priority as we move and prepare for autumn and winter and indeed is one of the contributing factors um, as to why our August um, ready to admit timelines um, had deteriorated because uh, the numbers of MOFD patients had increased um, in our beds. The 52 week breaches, we, we always knew it would get worse before it gets better and um, you know we're, we're absolutely tackling that. Uh, we were on a, uh, so myself and um, Chief Operating Officer on a call uh, yesterday and um, the numbers regionally and nationally, you know, are absolutely um, increasing very sharply. Um, the GP referral um, diagnosis on the cancer, uh, we are, are still um, above the um, standard uh, for the month of July. I think these are un yeah, so, but nevertheless, as you can see, there is a, <clears throat> a backlog which we are tackling and prioritising cancer and other urgent cases as part of our reset work and increasing the amount of non-COVID clinical work we are undertaking. Um, the cancer 62 days, um, we met the NHS constitutional standard um, in July. The staff vacancy rate, you know, we're pretty much at the staff, uh, sorry, at the trust standard, and we are onboarding um, about 130 uh, registered nurses um, in the months of September and October, which will be you know, the highest number that, that has ever joined us um, in the autumn period. So that is encouraging and the budget management is sort of neutral uh, because at the moment for the first six months of the year, the centre uh, covered the expenditure of trust uh, to achieve a balanced position. And the three important breakthrough projects, um, one is uh, about digital and one can see the report there as at the end of August that a tremendous amount of work has been done and continues to be done. 
and that is uh, you know more or less on track and going really well outpatient transformation you know it is an absolutely key program in terms of modernizing the way of we do outpatient services working in partnership with gps and um, this program of work uh, should be complete um, early 21. Um, but th this is happening on a phase basis. And um, I, you know, I think is truly innovative and will be, uh, and if it all comes together properly. Um, and so far, the pilots in cardiology and paediatrics appear to be uh, very effective. And lastly, it's about the work we'll be doing on achieving the CQC standards and the strategic objective of introducing the Mid-Yorkshire Daily Management System. Um, all the preparatory work is virtually complete and wave one will start um, recommencing the 28th of September. Happy to take any questions and I can see Lenore wants to come in. Just before you come in, Lenore um, and Simon and Stephen, um, just to say that um, <clears throat> there obviously will be a further discussion on performance in the um, when we have the integrated performance report later. So this just shows direction of travel. Um, Lenore, you want to come in first? Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I wanted to know that we spent a bit of time as a board talking about what to North would be this year, given the situation. I think what we've chosen um, is working. It, it, uh, it felt like a good measure to me when I reviewed it, and I wanted to thank the staff for helping to prepare for it. My one question is around FFT, because my understanding is FFT for patients isn't going to restart until December. And I'm just wondering if we've got some other way of seeking some patient views rather than waiting until the new year because everything is changing for patients just as it is for us. I, I personally, I am not aware of any proactive work that we are doing, but I can see David has know. come in and, um, and maybe David. Good night. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lenore. Um, uh, we, we're now considering whether we will be um, doing some um, scale of FFT across our own organisation. Uh, we had anticipated that the FFT would be back up and running uh, around September, but obviously that isn't going to be the case. Uh, and we do want to do that um, view from our patients around the quality of their service. So we're just pulling together now some opportunities of what that could be like, whether we use Picker um, to continue to do that, or either on the same scale as previous or, or differently. One of the difficulties that we have uh, that we all need to overcome is that obviously we wouldn't want to be using a paper based approach because of the IPC issue. Thanks, David. Debbie, do you want to come in on this as well or a different matter? Uh, no, on this, please, just to say that although it's probably not as robust and um, run in the same way as the FFT cards that we would normally use, Within, within division, and I'm sure other divisions are similar, we still have our patient experience group and we still share um, any complaints or indeed compliments that come from patients as a learning exercise. And that feeds through to our um, divisional governance group. So although it's not done in a sort of traditional structured way, we are still having those conversations within division. Thank you. Um, Stephen Radford. Can you hear me? Uh, all right, Keith. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right, just testing the minute. Um, I have a question on the uh, non emitted 52 week breaches. Martin, uh, two parts really. The first thing is do we have any sort of feeling at where this is going to top out given the rate of increase is quite alarming? Uh, as expected, I guess. But do we think, do we have a sort of projection as to where this will top out? And obviously this will be impacted by the reset program. So one's assuming that this is to a certain extent being prioritised as one of the things to tackle as part of yeah. reset. Is my understanding correct? 
on the second I, I, part? I can answer one of those questions and I will turn to either Jane or or Trudy and the second one. So the, the one I can answer is that we are doing the non-COVID work in order of clinical priority and chronological priority. Um, so the so that is why uh, for outpatients, you know, we are striving to get down to um, zero uh, 52 week breaches for outpatients. There are um, about three specialties, you know, where there are quite a few patients that um, are likely to breach uh, before things get better. Um, so that, that's why I said, you know, that the numbers are likely to increase before they start decreasing. Right. On, the, on the first of your points um, about where we think this is going to top out, um, I, I think, uh, Jane, you had conversations about the sort of trajectory um, on a month by month basis. Of yeah, yeah, that's that's in my, uh, I'm just trying to pull it up actually, but I can't find it. Yeah, so we've done, oh, I'll turn the video on as well, sorry. Yeah, so um, we've done a trajectory and as Martin's quite right, it's the admitted, not the non-admitted that we're still forecast to have some. So um, we can share the trajectory so it goes up and then it starts going down, but we still have 52 week breaches by the end of March. And as Martin said, it's in challenge specialties where we um, we have difficulties in terms of securing um, well, the, the right type of um, activity, if you like. I'm sure Trudy will be able to tell you which ones those are, to be perfectly honest. It's not like we're not trying to do something about it, but there are some specifics that we've got some issues with. But um, in terms of the 52 week breaches, we're in actually, compared to the rest of the whole of West Yorkshire and also the Northern region, a much, much better position. So um, if you want, I can share the trajectories that we've currently provided, and I'm sure Trudy could provide the detail of the actual individual specialties. OK. Do you, do you want to add anything, Trudy? Yeah, the main specialty is ENT. We're expecting recovery of the 52 week non admitted position across the trust, which was the plan that we put in place. It might get worse before it gets better, but there is recovery plans in place for all of those. But ENT is a significant capacity and demand imbalance, which we've raised before. That was a problem pre COVID, so there was no way it was going to not be a problem post COVID. There are, um, we've agreed with our CCG colleagues. Um, to purchase additional short and medium term capacity for outpatients and there are five meetings today with our ENT teams and our GP colleagues with a number of um, companies that can provide additional capacity and they're assessing the viability of those companies and the clinical governance associated with those today so that we can then make a decision on whether or not as part of our investment to recover that that is a key area that we want to, to put the money and that will recover the 52 week position but until they've had the meetings today I don't know which companies will be the ones that would be able to support to clear that backlog which means I can't give a clear trajectory for improvement because different companies can provide different amounts of capacity um, um, but we need to purchase 7,300 outpatient appointments between now and the end of the year in order to do that. Thank you. Okay. Is that Thank the end you. of the financial year or the calendar year? Uh, financial year. That's it. Great. Thank you. Um, I think Simon and then Amanda Mott. Thank you, Chair. Um, Martin, can we look at page 14 briefly, the 62 days from urgent GP referral? I just think not, not for detailed discussion now, but I think we could make this a lot clearer because we're saying the target is no more than 80 waiting by the end of the financial year. But when you look at the table, Oh, sorry, the graph, there are no numbers on it at all. So I have no idea what that's telling me. And then you know, and then lower down, it's got percentages in comparison to other organisations. So it's, it's just not a very clear chart is my proposition to you. That is page 16. 14. 14. 14. 14. Yeah. Um, because it says in the text that it's deteriorating, but if you look on the percentages, we've gone 79, 76, 76, and then 86. 
Yes. So what's what the okay? The the first three columns are published by the Department of Health. Yeah. What the fourth column is is July is our own figures, but we are not aware of what the other national figures are because the July data had not been published by the Department of Health at the time of writing this report. No, I understand that. I understand that. It's, it's confusing because we talk about a target being 80 as a numerical, and then in the bottom, it's all in percentages. There doesn't seem to be some correlation, and we need to look at that. But no, we no, no it isn't. It, oh? The target is 85% or more, and we have achieved in July 86.8%. Yes, which means that we're doing quite well. But if you look at what we say at the top of the table, uh, sorry, the top of that page, it says our our true north is to have no more than 80 people waiting over 62 days. And I yes. don't know whether the, I don't know whether when you look at the, the graphic. How many people are represented in July okay. above the? Thank you. That, that, my question. I guess, okay. I guess. Well, well, so, to me, 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 to no, I would like to come in at that point because okay. Simon's right, the table's not clear. Um, and but what that does give is an indication. So the July numbers are red at the top because they are unvalidated because we ha are always six to eight weeks out with the cancer reporting because of the, if you recall, we've had this conversation a lot. So I, I'm, I'm, apologies for repeating it. We get our performance <coughs> treatments, not on waiters. So the fact that it's deteriorated, we've got more patients waiting, but performance won't be reflected because they don't breach until they've been treated. So that's an indication that this is going to get worse before it gets better and that's what we've said clearly all along that 62 days as we start treating patients more and more post-covid performance will get worse and then it will recover so september august and september will be um uh, uh, the numbers of patients will be higher then performance will deteriorate and then it will get better thank you um amanda then gary Hi, good morning everyone. Um, on the report, I'm drawn to the um, key breakthrough projects, specifically the um, governance monitoring for the CQC, uh, achieving those standards. And I very much welcome the update and approach that's been put here. My question is, um, this is coming at a time in terms of the rollout and there looks to be a huge amount of um, work involved, Not not only on sort of rolling out the framework, but the additional resource to deploy those, those monitoring and, and assessments. Um, what assurance have we got that uh, come winter, these, these will be sort of embedded um, to ensure that we, we can still maintain them throughout what's going to be probably a quite challenging period. I mean, I, I think all, all we can, I mean, the realistic answer is, is that we will do our, everybody will do their best, you know, but it, it's very hard to predict actually what it is going to be like, you know, this autumn and uh, winter. You know, the, the very steep increases in the prevalence of COVID um, in the communities, you know, I, I think are really deeply, deeply concerning. And uh, I think, it, you know, a lot will depend in the next two to three weeks on the impact and effectiveness of the uh, government's announcements yesterday on, on, on restrictions to slow down the infection rate. So I, I, it, it, I can't answer that question in all honesty, Amanda. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jen. Uh, just on the medically optimised uh, discharge, and I know this is, um, I mean, if we look at it from 12 months on, we are, we are well, well below where, where we were, but, Absolutely. but, but unfortunately the, the trend looks to be upwards again. And it's, <laughs> what can we possibly, is, is there options? Are there any resources that are required to, to, to help support that situation? Um, 
basically because of, on top of what Marty just said about what could happen in the next few weeks as well and going back into winter again, um, the, the impact of that is, uh, is, is, is a concern. On the uh, 21st of August, um, NHS England Improvement um, published some really excellent guidance on discharge arrangements. And we are working through that both within the trust and with uh, both local authorities. Uh, so we, so each system um, is required to identify an exec director lead. And we have um, proposed that the director of social services in Kirkby's and the director of social services in Wakefield are the system executive directors to oversee the discharge arrangements in, in how we work. There is a considerable amount of uh, work that we need to do within the trust in implementing the guidance. And, um, and that is being overseen by Trudy, um, but being led by Erica McGuinness um, and colleagues in the PMO as well. So the, this is an urgent piece of work, but, but I think that guidance, you know, has um, compelling logic to it and um, it is going to be helpful. The, in the guidance, um, the government, you know, have confirmed further funding to fund uh, the care of people leaving hospital who can't go home without support and the government uh, will be providing some funding for the first six weeks of care that individuals require. Um, but that funding exists now and therefore you know why we do have so many medically optimised patients occupying the bed is, is concerning and um, at which we are you know, absolutely trying to get to the bottom of to develop a full understanding so we know what the effective solutions are going to be. Trudy, I can see you've put in a, couple, a question mark. Do you want to come in and add to that? Yes, if I may, Martin, because I think the key thing is that board will see different performance indicators in future. So we need to get our heads around the fact that this will go. Um, detox are not going to be recommenced in the current time and there isn't a plan to recommence those. So we need to look at that in our performance metrics. Medically fit for discharge is likely to be replaced by a criteria to reside. And that is the criteria by which you fit the need to be in hospital rather than by a criteria for discharge. We currently don't have that. We don't count that and we don't monitor that. So there's a significant piece of work to do there, as well as we need to educate all our staff. We need to educate patients and the public about what the hospital will be used for. That's a significant piece of work. And there will be four new discharge pathways with targets against them, with percentages of patients against each patient, not one, two and three, with percentages of how many should be against each and a time scale for leaving hospital. Once you are um, able, you no longer fulfil the fit to reside criteria. That's going to be a whole new language for us. So we're going to have to do some baseline information and then come back to board and explain that because we can't answer it at the minute because we don't record it like that. Thank you. There are no other questions. Um, nothing else you want to say, Mark? No, thank you. Just to say, I think this is quite a fascinating discussion because I think taken with what we've heard from colleagues in the literature this morning about the challenges of COVID and the challenges of reset, and now we're talking about True North, our aspirations and ambitions, there's a hell of a lot of stuff and a lot of balls being juggled here by colleagues in the, in the trust. And I just want to say the recognition of, of all the hard work that people have put in the agenda here. Thank you. And this amount of work going on. Um, that doesn't mean people, and, and one thing certainly I'm getting a feel for is nobody's taking an eye off the ball because there's too many balls to play here. But I do mean genuinely we should recognise the phenomenal amount of hard work and balls that have been juggled here by colleagues. So thank you very much for that, Martin.
Um, that leads us on nicely, although I'm running behind time now, to the Chair's Report from the Audit Committee. Gary, you chaired that. Do you want to give us a brief update from the Audit and Governance Committee on the 3rd of September? Yes, th th thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, one of the items that, 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 that come back to us was the patient group directions follow up audit, uh, and it did receive a significant assurance. However, it was noted there was still um, a number of issues that needed resolving, and, and, and I, uh, I resolved to, to, to uh, uh, talk further with, uh, with Julie Charge, chair, chair of the audit, audit committee, because I know that was something she'd been concerned about previously. But it did receive a significant assurance. It is, it is about tidying up some of the recommendations that to me seem just as easy to implement as, as not to at this time. Um, we received assurance, uh, we received the external auditor's annual letter. Uh, which detailed the results of the, of the, of the 1920 audit, uh, which had been communicated at the Extraordinary Trust Board meeting back, back in June. Uh, there were two exceptions noted regarding a referral to the Secretary of State under Section 30 of the Local Audit and Accountability Act 2014 in relation to the breach of the Trust statutory financial duty to break even over a three year period. Uh, there was also an exception for value for money conclusion in respect of the trust arrangements to secure economy, efficiency, effectiveness and its use of resources. I think the, 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 the short version of that is um, the consistency of approach of carrying on with the success of what we achieved in 1920 financially uh, would, would uh, actually um, sort both those issues out in the longer term. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's got a bit of the focus on, on, the, on the financial position moving forward this year. We also uh, received the internal audit plan, uh, which we know will have some disruptions uh, this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And basically, internal audit are planning to complete uh, at least 75% of the planned activity uh, on high priority risk areas um, so, so that they can give a meaningful assurance opinion uh, at the end of this financial year. Um, there was also, a, 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 I found very interesting update on, on medicines procurement uh, for branded and genetic medicines, where only one supplier exists. Uh, and, and the committee were assured with regards to the process and noted uh, that there was, a, there was a relatively minor exception, which was noted there was a process in place to, to deal with that in, in the future. Uh, and also the counter fraud report was received and the committee noted that a lot of work had taken place with regards to awareness. Uh, we also received a review as ever the Minutes from Quality Committee, uh, Results and Performance Committee and Risk Committee. Um, I think Jay and that con concludes. Yeah, the good, it was a good meeting. Good meet. Thank you. Any questions for Gary as Deputy Chair of Order? No? We'll receive that, that update from him. We'll move on then, colleagues, to item 2.2, .2, which is a quarter one update on the BAP and the, the Trust Level Risk Register. Now, this is for receiving. However, I would specifically want to point out to people that at Section 3 on assessment, we are asked as a board to give some guidance. So we'll be asking people to not make a decision as such, but particularly give a steer um, in terms of some of the principal risks in the light of the recent pandemic and some of the challenges that's created for those risks. Sheila, do you want to? Yeah, thank discussion? you very much. So this is the quarter one BAF and trust level risk register report for 2021 and quarter two will come to the December meeting. Um, so as normal to this report, you've got three attachments. One is the summary of the BAF um, scores and assurance levels. Then you've got the actual board assurance framework, the BAF itself, and then you've got the trust level risk register. So just a reminder, we've got 11 principal risks in the board assurance framework, which align to our strategic objectives. And we have at the moment 15 uh, trust level risks in the trust level risk register. Um, so the paper sort of gives you some of the background which we normally have in, in, but the difference is in section three, and it follows on from conversations with the chairs of resource and performance and quality committee who have um, considered when the committees have to assign assurance um, and a principal risk is really quite wide ranging or contains a constitutional or a target, performance target, which just won't be met this year because of COVID, how do they assure even if they feel that there's really good systems and processes in place? So I've put in the paper a couple of options um, where we could change 
the wording of the BAF or the other option is to not make any changes but to accept that we will probably have limited assurance for um, some of these standard principal risks throughout the year. So if we can come back to that discussion, I'll just um, briefly go through the rest of the paper. Um, and then below that, there's a recommendation from Lenore as chair of the Quality Committee, just to change the wording slightly on two of the principal risks, not to lose anything, but just to shift um, the uh, re reference to the NHS constitutional standards um, from three to four, um, which feels more appropriate. Trust level risks on page four, probably just to note the ones that are closed and opened. So 379L about patients experiencing harm due to excessive transfer times has was closed by the Division of Medicine, but they reopened that as an updated one in 4800. And um, 4768 opened. There's a number of finance and capital ones opened, 4768, 4767 and 4786. I've put 4768 twice in there. Um, and we've added 4461 in relation to lack of career progression, employment experience, proportionate BAME representation of staff above Sound 7. Cyber security risk came off the Trust Level Risk Register because it was closed. We've removed the um, risk around removal of junior doctor training posts um, and harm to patients caused by pool falls. When they come off the trust level risk register, they still remain in Datix, so they're still being managed within the divisions and uh, relevant directorates. So um, that's the summary of the paper, and I, I suppose now it's really to ask the board for comments, both on the change, the slight changing to the wording of three and four, but also how we approach provide giving assurance on the principal risks during this um, financial year. Can I, can I just say before we move on, one or two of our colleagues are having difficulty with the technologies, so I know some people can see and hear us, but, but for some reason can't contribute. So you may have been sent some comments by email from Julie Charles, I think, maybe regarding this item, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> so colleagues, uh, I'm going to open up to questions, David Fossil. Thanks, Chair. So just on the issue of um, moving the constitutional standards from risk three to risk four, um, I suppose there's an argument to say that it's equally inappropriate in risk four because we're then lumping together um, issues about the constitutional standards with expected outcomes. And you could actually have situations in which they were very good outcomes, but because of access, as an example, because of access problems, um, the constitutional standard in respect of waiting time wasn't met. So, so I think there's a problem with that as well. And actually looking at your table above with the, with the revision options um, in a more fundamental way, I think that addresses it better, Celia. Um, Amanda and then Simon Stone. Uh, thank you. I, I wanted to say I, I appreciate the work you've done on this Celia to um, enhance the actual assurance by giving us some indication of recency um, in those columns. So overall that process for me is uh, is improved. So thank you. Thank you. Simon. Thank you Chair. Um, I just want to support the idea of us being clearer that what the committees are doing when they review this is making sure that the systems are, and controls are in place and being used. So if we go back to the financial sustainability and VFM one, for example. Um, yeah, now, now that we are a system and we all support each other, that might be more achievable. But in the past, it was structurally impossible to, to deliver. But we were assured that we had the systems in place to understand where we were and what was what was achievable. So I, I strongly support the idea that the committees and indeed the board are looking to make sure we have controls and, and systems in place and being used. And that's what you get the assurance about, not, not whether you've delivered the actual outcome on things that can't be delivered. Okay. Anybody else wish to come in at this point before I kind of go back to the four principal risks that we have to revise the options of. I've got Julie's okay, comments, Julie, sorry, but they're sorry. on the um, risk rather than the BAF. So okay. Okay. Um, so item three, 
current principal risk, and then there's a proposal from, I think, David Melia and uh, Lenore at the bottom about what that wording should say. You've also thrown in your views, David. So, so does anybody, Lenore, do you want to make a comment? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. The first thing I wanted to say was I, I support what Simon has just said about when the committees review this, they're talking about do we have the assurances about control and management? And um, it's about the grip and control as opposed to necessarily knowing that we've hit um, a target. And with, with that in mind, um, I think going with um, the first option to re reword where you, you focus on uh, patient experience and then you focus on patient outcomes and standards um, separately works from my point of view. Uh, Jane. Yeah, sorry, uh, I was, I was uh, really going back to the point that Simon made about right. the in, um, number eight in terms of the, the final. Can we put that up at number eight then? I'll, I'll go through sorry, seven. Four. It was number seven. Sorry, it was number yeah. seven. Yeah. We'll, yeah. Put up, we'll put that up at number seven. I want to capture the essence of that. So in terms of number three, the revised option will say, does anybody, I don't know, do you want to propose what that revised option should say, Mr. Committee Chair? <coughs> Hello? Sorry, I'm trying to catch up with clicking on the technology. Sorry, it's um, okay. At the bottom of page three, there is a proposal yeah. about principal risk three. Yeah, I've got that. Two, um, and then four, that is the proposal that's being put forward. Are people happy to accept to chair the Quads Committee's proposal round number three? Thank you. And for number four, the one that the um, David have put forward. Well, it just comes back to my. What, what do you want to put? Well, I suppose it's just a question of whether I agree that constitutional standards should come out of three. Yeah. I'm just wondering if we're just switching from one to the other and that it's still a problem if it sits within four. Because equally you could have, you could provide expected outcomes but not meet constitutional standards, which I think is the problem yeah. that was being highlighted under the previous point. So I just wonder if we're switching, if we're switching the problem from one to another, but actually it's, it's, I mean, it might be less inappropriate in four than three. I think it probably is, but it's still, it's still, I think we still might encounter the same problem. I'm waiting for the note to give a view. Sorry, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, and, and this is, this is, uh, um, perhaps to discuss between the chair of resource and performance and the incoming chair of quality. But if you look at... Um, <laughs> that was definitely bad. Not very good. Well done. He's sitting in the conversation. I do have a practical suggestion. Yeah. There is a, under um, the principal risk eight, there is failure to comply with targets, statutory and regulatory duties and functions. Yeah. Does do those targets include the constitutional standards? And and Celia may be best to answer that particular one, because if it does, then we're counting it twice anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Number eight is all about sort of the well led and the trust board scorecard, so it does include all of that. And I suppose just going back to the principles of a board assurance framework, the principal risks are the risks of the trust not achieving its strategic objectives. So. If we have um, a strategic, you know, that is what we need to uh, provide assurance on is meeting the strategic objectives. Yeah. So, you know, it goes back to being a well governed trust with sound finances. Mm. So, we don't necessarily have to um, make a detailed reference to particular targets okay. and standards, uh, in my view, but I'm um, happy to take. Everybody's just reading, by the way, down the chat. Yeah. 
I'm not sure whether they agree that the chair, the incoming chair of quality should discuss it. <laughs> I'm not sure. But, but, but coming back to my point earlier, I, I think that's why I was saying, I think what's being proposed higher up, that you bundle all those things together under eight, covers that off. And right, yeah. we're not leaving the constitutional standards sort of as a stray thing that we're trying to bundle into another one. So you want that to be, you think that would be suitable for um, the and four? Yeah, because I think if we put constitutional standards under A, then that covers, I would see that as covering it for everything. Yes, yes. okay. Um, but I'm happy to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, in principle, the incoming chair of the Quality Committee has proposed a solution, which you'll discuss with the chair of RAP, um, and then we will circulate that outside of this meeting so that everybody's happy. Uh, is the board happy with that proposal? Yeah. 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 Yes. I also want to say that see, there's also made a comment here, which is we need to also be aware that the committee may be unable to assign any more than limited assurance for the whole year and reflect its reason in committee and board minutes. People are happy to acknowledge that, that. Although the committee is, as I said earlier, the whole team are working hard at achieving it, we need to recognise because of the unique situation we're in that we may be unable to say any more than limited assurance in certain things and certain risks for the whole year. Are people happy with that? Simon, you want to come in? Yeah. Yeah, two things. Two things. I want to know what James is going to say about um, seven, but also if we I agree with David <coughs> T. Um, if we have everything pulled into eight, then we can actually do a limited assurance on our delivery, but with this associated commentary about our controls and systems and that that it seems to me squares that circle quite neatly right and Celia is capturing all of that as we speak yeah. um jane here's okay do you want to say anything on seven before simon? No, I'm, I'm just i was supporting simon really i just think we're you know the, the added words that we've got there you know about um you know in light of the financial arrangements in place for 2021 reflects where we are and i think it's important that we do that that we don't just stick to the you know the, the previous words, I think the revised words that Silly's put together is really, really sensible because, you know, the, it, we're in a completely different world. We're not almost like an island in ourselves, reliant upon our own um, systems and processes. It's actually it's talking to the wider system as well, and it that change in wording allows that to reflect that change. I think it's a really good suggestion, Celia. Right. Are we all happy with that? There's no more. Question marks, no more chat. Trust level risk register. Trust level risk register. There's a question from Julie. So Julie Charles got a question on that, so she will read it out because of communication. Yeah. So Julie's asking about 2929 cybersecurity risk, which was closed. What's the nature of the risk? Um, it was on, it's been on the trust level risk register for about three years, Julie. So it was a general one, and Mark might be able to be more specific about the trusts. Um, ability to respond to um, the risk of cyber security. Um, so I, I think Mark's team may be looking at this and probably developing a new one. And the next time the team come to the risk committee, we have got that on the agenda to pick up with Mark. Um, Julie says she's pleased for cyber security to be in the board assurance framework. And in terms of uh, a new risk of COVID, I'd suggest another gap in control, or board assurance, right, sorry, would be the confusing landscape that's developing and different rules in different areas. At the end of risk for 800, the update was at June, um, but the level of risk has changed given we're now in September 4,800. Is the um, Division of Medicine, one about excessive time to transfer to PGH and peripheral sites. So that would be one of Trudy's probably to comment. So, Mark, have you got any comments on the cyber security one closing? No, I think you, you're quite right in relation to it. Was, it was probably too generic um, and, and the fast moving pace of, of cyber. You know, we, we need to make sure that our risk assessments are actually focusing on the current uh, here and now risks and not looking at things over a three year period and, and in too generic a term. So we, we've significantly enhanced our uh, internal processes. Obviously, there's the uh, central alerting system, the care cert systems that were referred to earlier um, in, in the board. 
Um, so we're, we're now looking at this as, as a much more targeted um, assessment process rather than having that overarching generic one. But there are still a significant number of risks that the division are managing, but we're managing them as part of our processes. I just want to raise one point under the changes to TLR. So 293 removed from TLR, is it just three numbers or is that? Yes, it's a very old one, right. it's been up for okay. yeah. So does that, that's removed entirely from trust level risk register, but will remain in Karen's, in Karen's director. medical director at risk register. So again, that would continue to be picked up in the risk committee. Yeah. Um, I'm not aware of any other points anybody wishes to raise. Um, Unless that's another question mark from Simon Stone that I've missed. No? Thank you. We therefore are asked to receive that. And I will also commit once uh, David T and Simon have had a conversation with Celia, and we'll circulate the wording correctly that will now appear on the bath. Thank you. Item 2.3, colleagues, is the fit and proper person annual report. So this comes from the company secretary. I'm asked to see this. Anything you want to say? Let's see. No, I think it says everything it needs to say. Does anybody have any questions on this report? Are we happy to receive it? Thank you very much. Right, we are now going to have item 3.1, and I'm back on time, which is a report from RAP in July. Um, Simon. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you say, we met last in July, 24th of July, in fact, and at that time, and uh, things may now have changed, but at that time we were still waiting for NHS improvement uh, to respond to our emergency PDC bid, which we needed to get the capital programme underway. Um, I suspect we still haven't got a clear answer on that, but it certainly was a, a major concern at the time. We did receive assurance in a number of areas, however. We were assured of continued tight management of income and expenditure as well as cash, uh, so a, a much more um, sanguine committee this financial year than it has been in the past. Reference cost work, um, which has to be submitted, was going to plan and an external audit by Ernst & Young had given a moderate assurance opinion to our programme, which actually was a significant improvement over the previous years. So we're on the right track with our uh, reference cost work. We reviewed the reset programme with uh, colleagues and, and noted the progress and the challenges that are being faced. Uh, we discussed vacancies uh, which are continuing to reduce in number, but against that looked at the sickness and absence which remains high. However, when we excluded the COVID related sickness and absence, actually the position was not too significantly bad. Not as good as we'd like, but a lot better than it looked initially. And finally, we took the equality, diversity and inclusion quarterly report uh, and went through it in some detail with colleagues and were assured that there is continued progress despite the problems of the pandemic uh, on inclusion and diversity work. That was it. Any questions for the chair of the Resource and Performance Committee? People are happy to note that. And the next meeting of the RMP will be on the 25th of September. It's about this. It will be a fairly major agenda because you haven't met for about two months. So, Good. Um, risk committee. We have minutes from the risk. We have a report on the risk committee on the 23rd of July and the 19th of August. Martin. I have nothing to add to the report. Happy to take any questions. Um, anybody? Oh, somebody's got some comment up on them. Amber? No? No, then we will accept this from the chair of the risk committee. Thank you very much. Item 3.3 then brings us to the trust board scorecard. Jane will introduce it and I think all EDs will be taken <coughs> part of the item. Jane. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've got the uh, scorecard information and I will uh, do what I usually do, which is for the first few sections, I'll, I will hand over to my colleagues. I know they've, they've all got something to say. So first of all, could I just hand over to David in terms of covering the sections under his domain, please? Uh, thank you very much, Jane. 
Uh, so colleagues, there's um, uh, two items I'd like to bring to colleagues' attention, and that was around the, um, the, the increased rate of Clostridium difficile infections that have been um, uh, within the trust over the past uh, few months. Uh, I think we mentioned this on a previous occasion. Um, I can confirm that this is a, a, a picture that's happening across the country and it would seem to be attributable to the higher rates of antibiotics that have been used um, uh, within COVID care uh, over the, uh, the, the past uh, six months, uh, particularly the use of a, an antibiotic called coamavitlan. The, um, the issue uh, we, we've already mentioned about the friends and family test, uh, and so that's why that is an outstanding issue. Um, and we do have a, a large, uh, an increased number continuing of harms uh, within the organisation. And again, these are attributable to um, uh, pressure ulcers. Uh, the latest figures that uh, supersede this information would indicate that pressure ulcers per thousand bed days uh, within the, the hospital setting uh, are reducing uh, not to the rate that I would want, but they are reducing. Uh, however, within community services, they still remain pro problematic. And I know that that's an issue that Karen Benstead, the Assistant Director of Nursing uh, in that area, is working very um, diligently with our uh, tissue viability matron um, to come up with a, a different strategy. Thank you. Any questions for the... No. Thank you. Okay, can I uh, hand over to Karen, please? Thank you. Um, the one thing I want to pull out this month is the never event that's been reported. Um, this related to a wrong site biopsy in dermatology. Um, the board in the quality committee received a detailed paper on the event, the work going on with regard to never events last week um, and requested that we come back in three months time with an update on that work. So that was um, had it airtime in quality committee. Don't intend to say any more unless there are questions about that. And the same for mortality, the learning from deaths review goes into quality committee next month. And so that will be given detailed um, discussion there. We bring that to the board next time. Thanks, Karen. Can I just bring Celia in at this point? Uh, there's a question from Julie here, uh, Karen. It's, she says that VTE is steadily trending downwards. And would you be able to comment, please? Um, VTE, um, there are, again, that was um, covered in quality committee with the division of medicine. And um, my understanding there at the moment is we've got two systems where it's recorded and we've got a, a transition from one to the other at the moment, which is causing some difficulty in the way we collect the numbers. I have no um, information to suggest that patients are not getting assessments as they need them. Thank you, Jane. Okay. So just a couple of things. Um, the first was on the VT issue, as Karen says. The specific issue that was highlighted at Quality Committee was about the inclusion of the risk of the VT risk assessment on the whiteboard, which I think there was general feeling would be an improvement. The problem at the moment is that whilst the information about that risk assessment appears in PPN Plus you have to go through a number of clicks to find it because my question at the committee was how easy it was for consultants on a post take ward round to establish whether the VT assessment had been done and the answer was that it is there in PPM plus um, but it's not that easy to access and clearly in a busy post take ward round anything that makes that information easier to access um, would be helpful so I think that was the key point that, that was being made in relation to the change um, and, and as always, it's one of these things about recording versus actually doing. Um, and, and, and it's, but of course, those two are linked because on a on a ward round, if you don't know whether it's been done or not, you can't probe to make sure it is done if it, if it hasn't. So that was the first point. And the second point I wanted to make was in relation to mortality, which clearly, based on those numbers, 
um, shows shows a, a dramatic rise over the last couple of months. But there is, and clearly COVID is relevant to this, and I think consistent with that is the fact that the HSMR has gone up very dramatically, whereas the shimmy, um, which as we've said before here and elsewhere, um, doesn't incorporate COVID deaths, hasn't changed much. So I think that is consistent with it being a COVID effect, but clearly we need to square that off and delve into it in a bit more, much more detail, which as Karen says, I'm sure the learning from deaths um, process will do. Thank you. Simon, do you want to come in? Yes, just briefly, Chair, thank you. Um, just on VTE, it's worth noting for the board that the Quality Committee, we asked the Division of Medicine to do some more detailed deep dive around that issue and particularly looking at readmissions uh, because there had been a number of readmissions with um, either a pulmonary embolus or a deep vein thrombosis. So we're expecting at our next meeting with Medical Division to actually look at it in a lot more detail at it. Thank you, Simon. Um, right, Jane, back to you. Yep, I'll mute myself. Uh, Trudy, did you want to come in on the and uh, your uh, section, please, on responsive? Thanks, Jane. Um, so, in the responsive section, the first section of um, worth of note is the ambulance handovers, which continue to show um, a struggling position in terms of um, we are having 30 and 60 minute breaches. We look at these every day and validate them and the themes are when the department is busy and um, we are struggling to offload ambulances in a timely way due to the red and green streams and COVID restrictions in the department. So it is a theme that's associated with COVID. The root cause of that is obviously um, an issue with backdoor outflow, which relates to our earlier conversations about patients in the bed base longer than they need to be. And the fact that we are almost back or practically back at pre-COVID levels of A&E activity with much of that activity um, having the opportunity to be seen in alternative environments. So our GP colleagues have been doing shadow shifts in A&E with Sarah Robertshaw to understand the sorts of patients that we could look after in an alternative environment. And we'll be linking in with the national um, developments in terms of NHS 1-1 first, and that campaign will, will launch next week um, to, to try and help to manage the numbers of patients who are attending A&E who could actually be seen in an alternative place. Um, so is there any questions for me on that section before I move on to the next one? No. Delayed transfers of care, clearly um, that is the February position and we will need to review whether or not we continue to have this on because it won't be recommenced in the near future. So it is just taking up space on the report essentially and that will be um, part of the, the strategic view we take of how we manage the new discharge guidance. RTT, this performance will start to improve because ERS is now open. So the denominator will change because the uh, patient referrals will now start to come back in. So we will see a, a sort of a, a flexing performance that's not necessarily related to an improving position. So this is a little bit misleading. So we need to bear that in mind as we look at the RTT performance. And we've covered 52 weeks. Is there anything on RTT or 52 weeks for organs cancer and diagnostics? No, diagnostics, the driver for diagnostic performance is really um, endoscopy, as we've discussed before. I know Lenore's going to raise the uh, quality committee report because it was discussed at quality committee. So the the um, backlog of cancer and urgent patients will be cleared as per the trajectory that we gave by the end of next week. So that is on target and that's with the use of an insourcing co company as well as outsourcing through AQPs. The backlog of the DMO1 reporting, which is the six week diagnostic section, which includes the routine and planned patients, will not be cleared. Um, and it has moved. Um, the end of September position is likely to be at about 1200. We're still booking patients in end of August 1400. So it is coming down. But if we want to clear that backlog to zero, we will have to maintain the level of capacity we've got within sourcing and outsourcing until the end of the financial year. 
that's a decision for us to make um, because at the moment we've only secured the insourcing capacity until the end of October. There's a significant challenge that we've got with our CCG colleagues about how we optimise the use of the AQPs because that's their contract to manage, not ours. So we've had a challenge meeting this week and we will continue to keep an eye on that. So is there anything on diagnostics before I do the rest of cancer? No. Diagnostics, the key risk we've got, we said for September would be breast two week wait um, because of the loss of capacity. This has been a high risk service for a significant period of time because of workforce challenges and you know all the actions we've taken to secure workforce um, and the retirement and return was causing us a problem in September. We will have breaches in September. We're hoping to try and compensate some of those because we have secured some locum capacity. There is a significant risk attached with the national profile of breast at the moment. So, you know, a very high profile member of um, Girls Aloud has been diagnosed with um, a, a significant progressive breast cancer. And when that happens, we always see a huge peak in referrals. So I have committed to the team to continue with the high cost locums in there because because we are going to see another another peak on the back of this. It always, always happens. So we've got to be prepared that this is a fragile service because of the diagnostic capacity and we're using everything that we can. But um, September is going to be tricky, but we always knew that and we always said that and we've explored every option possible. 62 days, we aren't doing too bad on, as you can see, but that will deteriorate in September because we're treating more and more of those patients. Um, and that's really good that we are treating them, but they will then show as breaches. So there will be an ongoing issue with um, the 62 day performance. So um, I don't have anything else unless anybody has questions. Anybody, any questions for the Chief Operating Officer? I'm not picking any up in the chat, Judy. Um, hey, Simon, Simon got one. Simon, did you want to come? Simon, oh, you got one. No, yes, you just come in, you're quite right, Judy. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Trudy, on cancer 62 days from referral from NHS screening, is that is it naught percent because there is no NHS screening service at the minute, or, or wasn't rather, back in the um, middle I, of the I pandemic? Don't, sorry, I'm just having a look. So it, it, target's 90 percent and it was 83, 88, 60, 0, 0. I just wonder why it's suddenly gone to zero and I assume it's because there was nobody being referred in. Um, honestly, I don't know, Simon. That for, I I really did not pick on that up on that. I'm really sorry. I'll have to have a look at that because I don't know the answer. Okay, thank you. Apologies. That's right. Okay, I don't think of any other questions in the chat from anybody. So Jim, back to you. Yeah, so I'm going to hand over to Philip now for um, his section, please. Thank you very much. Uh, just a few points to make. First of all, I think it's noteworthy that um, the staff, family and friends test quarter one, uh, we decided to do ourselves as a trust and added questions in relation to COVID. Um, there was no requirement to publish this data or submit data to NHS England and indeed we've had no instruction yet to turn that back on. Um, but it's noteworthy of the fact that we did get 65.6% .6 which exceeded our target of 65% in quarter one. So I'm really pleased to see that. Um, we're in quarter two now, um, that survey uh, has been completed. We're just waiting for the information to come back in. Um, I do worry about um, obviously the long term impact of working at such pace uh, we'll have on Q2 and indeed the response rates um, as well for that survey. But we'll keep an eye on that and I'll re update the board um, in due course. But really pleased that we got to the uh, target for Q1. On staff sickness and absence, you'll see that there's been a noticeable decline on reduction in the number uh, of people off sick. So you'll see that sickness percentage has gone down from 6.8% to 4.84%, which is pleasing to see. And of that 4.84%, 4.2% is non-COVID related. Throughout the period of the pandemic, we've been continuing to manage long-term sickness and we've recently restarted short-term sickness, but very much with a focus on providing a caring uh, and compassionate um, interview with people where we're talking to them about both long-term and short-term, particularly what we've been through. Uh, and as a team, we've made available a new report to the exec team on a heat map so we can keep a weathered eye on any sudden increases in COVID related absences across all of our uh, departments across the trust. Turnover remains within uh, reasonable levels and below target. And as Martin alluded to earlier in the meeting, uh, vacancies we will have a significant increase in the number of registered nurses joining the trust. 
um, but just worthy of note from my own point of view, if you take the same month list time last year, we have 115 whole town equivalent fewer vacancies than we had 12 months ago, which is great because we know the link between having fuller establishments and the ability of people to deliver the quality of care that they want to deliver. Final comment from me is just about non-medical appraisal. Um, you'll see that that has reduced. We did relax the rules on uh, pay and incremental progression during the period of the pandemic. And of course, appraisal was one of the factors that needed to be in play for somebody to uh, proceed with their increment. Uh, we will be switching that back on again with three months notice from the 1st of January. Um, and for those who've read the NHS People Plan, you'll see there's an absolute focal point on appraisals going forward. So we really need to refresh our approach to that. And there's this notion that we'll also have health and wellbeing conversations with all staff and we're currently planning what that would look like and we'll take that through the normal COVID governance structures. So those are the main points from me from a workforce point of view. I've not been, I've not been made aware of any... Um, go Gary, yeah, sorry, this room, yeah. Sorry, Chair. Uh, yeah, Chair, just, just looking at the, uh, the, the staff sickness absence, which is pleasing to see. That, 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 that's uh, well, well within target. The staff vacancy rate is very close to target. So why is the agency uh, uh, spend on nurse and medical staffing still above target? Okay, can I, so Gary, from, from a, a perspective, the, the majority, well, a big chunk of the um, agency spend is actually down to uh, COVID. So my finance report, the 7.4 million year to date agency, 2.1 of it is COVID related. So um, if we if you strip that out, it would actually be lower than last year. And the, the biggest staff group is in med, is in medical. So in nursing, for example, be using less agency than we did last year, substantially so, but not not in medical. And under that is I think there's I'm sure Philip will explain it's a lot of it is about shielded as well. It's mostly shielded uh, shielded staff members medical in the division of medicine and, and, and jane is that that's all within the break-even situation at the moment but but post the new the new regime when you get that would you expect that still to be covered off as well that additional cost <laughs> we, so the thing that we do so that the new financial arrangements at the moment which i'll come on to you know it's allowing us to break even the new financial arrangements will have so at the moment we we get um we get paid, you know, we get it retrospectively funded for anything that we need to break even. Going forward, the new arrangements will have three sums of money. We'll have a block amount, which we currently have. We don't know what that block will be. There'll be COVID costs, which will be prospective. So be, this is your COVID costs. We don't know how they're calculating that, but it's across the system. And a second uh, one will be a top up, because you know we get a top up as well. So um, which sort of like reflects the difference between the blocks and the income that you're receiving so there's three amounts of money we have no idea what that's going to look like so this the covid cost that we collect we have to report on a monthly basis and it's quite clear what we spent on covid uh, which includes that medical agency spend so you would suggest wouldn't you that that based on those trends that you would expect to get funding for that in future but we still do not know that is the case Right. Um, anybody else? Any other question? Nothing else in the chat. So, Jay, over to you for finance, I think. OK, I mean, I've covered a little bit of it already. So um, on, on the money, as, as we all know, the, uh, the financial arrangements allow the trust to break even. So if you can see on the report that year to date, COVID costs are eight point nine million pound. Um, Five point two of that actually relates to pay um, of the eight point nine and three point seven non pay. Um, the peak of the COVID costs was actually in the second month of the year when in, in May uh, and they've reduced every month since then, to be perfectly honest. Um, so I don't know what the COVID costs we will be given um, in terms of the new financial arrangements going forward. Um, you can also see that we've got top up of that you can see <coughs> a million pound top up that we've received that and that's the amount that allows us to break even. Um, so that, that's basically it. and month five, I've just been going through month five, looks very, very similar. Um, from a cash perspective, we've got significant amount of cash in the bank because the other aspect of the financial arrangements is that we were paid um, two months, if you like, instead of one at the very, very beginning. So we're a month in hand and cash at the bank is £58.4 million. Pounds. 
Um, and I'll come, we'll, we'll discuss some of the capital uh, in the private board this afternoon. Um, so that's all I was going to say, actually. And I think it's fair to say that that £58.4 million, although it's in the bank and it could be deemed to be cash in hand, has already been budgeted for um, as part of our future spend between now and the end of the financial year. Yeah, it'll, 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 it'll wash out. I don't yeah. think it's extra money just for the sake of it. It's that like extra money being given to us in advance pending future expenditure. Yes, that's right. That's right, Keith. Yeah. Um, any questions for the Director of Finance? So we are recommended that the Trust Board note the information. I think we seek assurances of actions to address underperformance identified. But I think that's a very fruitful discussion. I think at times it could be quite, you know, when we look at the way forward, it's looking very daunting and very challenging as to what we have to do. But certainly I think, and certainly I, speak, I think I speak for other members of the board, I think certainly we have in place actions to address underperformance, unless David also tells me other ones because he wants to come in. Now, just a general point on, on the report, there's just a, a few places under the exception reports where we don't have Y axes. So um, it's just for the next report to, to pick those up because there are some of them in areas, for example, RTT, where Obviously, performance has dipped a lot, and it's not entirely clear from the graphs uh, where we're up to. So, just for clarity. The so y axis, you'd say? Yeah. Right, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Just the labelling, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, colleagues, if we're happy, we will move on. First of all, I must apologise, though, because I admitted the chief executive getting a chance to have more airtime earlier, admitting not had enough, give us an update on COVID 19 and research. So at the end of the meeting, I'll ask Martin to just give us a verbal update on COVID-19 and reset. So we would have done that earlier. But if we move on now, we will have the chair's report from the College Committee, Lenore. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. The uh, Quality Committee had another long meeting and I have a number of things to share with you. So the first is that there was an infection outbreak of quite a common condition in the neonatal unit that affected four babies. One of those babies was very unwell and sadly died. When all of this happened, services were um, changed, there was a deep clean and there have been no further infections. There was full duty of candour with all of the families and the families and the staff have all been supported. And that, that um, event is now considered over. The other issues that were raised, um, testing of COVID, uh, COVID for staff has been subject to delay. So uh, the reset team has been looking at using internal capacity so that we can speed up the response. Um, last year, we achieved masks for safeguarding for one of the first times in many years. But following COVID, we have seen a small slip and we are just below target in that area. Uh, the oncology service has identified a number of areas for improvement. They are, um, it's a priority area for them. They're looking at reviewing pathways and processes. And as part of that work, the pharmacy team has been investigating some uh, no and low harm incidents and supporting learning and development. As we've discussed, VTE was uh, a focus and uh, Dom have been asked to come back with further work on that. And we continue to find ourselves supporting patients with mental health needs where they don't have acute physical needs. And that's happening particularly out of hours. And that, of course, is challenging for those patients because they're not in the right environment, but also challenging for us because those patients need support. And that means our staff are supporting them and not um, other patients. And we also discussed that there will continue to be pressure in radiology. And, and that's just due to... COVID and changes in uh, how patients move through the service. There were a number of assurances. We received the uh, interim report on the cluster of never events, as Karen mentioned, um, and they will come back to us in three months time. But we were, we were assured about immediate learning and uh, actions taking place. The, we have had a delirium nurse in post as a pilot. That has become a substantive post. And we are currently piloting mental health navigators. And I think, again, that's a, a, going to be a really important piece of work, particularly in this post um, immediate pandemic period and ongoing. We received the annual safeguarding report and we noted the complexity of the area and the teams that are in place to support those issues. Um, 
As discussed, PGDs came up and the fact that there had been significant assurance because that has been an area of focus for some time. We talked about the endoscopy trajectory, as Trudy has mentioned. Um, we also noted that there has been strong recruitment. Again, that's been discussed today in staff groups, particularly in DOM. The reset scorecard was shared and we discussed what services are reopening and that patient swabbing is occurring on all three sites. We received the IPC annual report. And we also noted that the anti ligature work that's been ongoing across the trust for some time is now completed, which was a CQC action. So that was really good news. We've been monitoring that for some time. And finally, uh, the maternity service is doing some work to address the disproportionate poor outcomes for BAME pregnant women. And uh, we're looking at how we support those communities to get better outcomes. And finally, uh, we've asked the Division of Medicine when they return next month to focus on their incidence backlog and what they're doing about the learning from incidents and reducing um, the number in the backlog. And finally, uh, it was also reported to the committee that as a result of some due diligence work that had been going on, we'd identified uh, that we had reported in our annual report that there had been no reportable radiation incidents but in fact that there had been two. So all appropriate actions have been taken and investigations are ongoing about that, but we do need to acknowledge that the annual report was um, had the wrong information in it. And that is my lengthy update from Quality Committee. Lengthy but comprehensive, thorough and clear. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm not sure there are any questions on that report. Are there any questions for the Chair of Quality. Right, thank you very much, Lenore. Um, OK, we now have a paper on the staff in the unit 4.2, which is from the Director of Nursing. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, well, I'll be aware that normally at this time of year I'd pre be presenting one of the uh, six monthly um, staffing reviews uh, that we um, uh, have uh, taken place uh, and that would be something that we would use the, the national <laughs> board guidance and we use all those metrics around um, care hours per patient per day. Uh, however, because of the pandemic um, that was stood down nationally, uh, the requirement for us to do that. Uh, and instead we have used the guidance that came out from NHS England Improvement uh, around the pandemic, around how to release staff from across the, our, our organisations uh, to uh, better prepare for the expected um, surge in, in demand for critical care um, capacity uh, and capacity within uh, other acute wards. Uh, I, I won't go into all the details of all the actions that, that took place for us to be able to do that. Um, uh, and so uh, what we have done uh, for board is to provide a, a brief paper to give assurance that as those moves and changes happened and our um, bed stock in entirety uh, reduced in number but changed in function, um, that we uh, allocated our staff uh, across the organisation to ensure that there was appropriate numbers of staff to care for more critical care patients to care for patients both in the intensive care unit and <coughs> as um, uh, uh, Parry mentioned earlier, uh, the, the increased number of uh, NIV patients within the organisation uh, and how we safely did that. So um, there, on page uh, two of the paper, there is a, a chart that's uh, a table that describes the reduction of beds uh, and our establishments of nurses and how we um, uh, what the gap uh, was uh, and around the, the numbers of staff that we required to staff those beds. Uh, we did, as colleagues know, we have had a, a, an outstanding uh, registered nurse vacancy for, for many years now and that has been slowly reducing, but that did uh, mean that when we closed beds and closed and reduced services, that those vacancies were able to be uh, reduced for our bed capacity uh, and it, it enabled us to uh, shorten that gap considerably. Um, 
we were uh, supported in being able to provide uh, appropriate and safe care by the release of second and third year student nurses back into the uh, into the workforce uh, and they worked at bands three and four uh, within the um, period of, of service within the trust and uh, their service to the organisation um, was exceptionally um, uh, well received and it was th they they provided uh, uh, amazing contributions to pay patient care so that they actually provided over a hundred uh, whole time equivalent posts uh, to our trust uh, during that time. They have all now either re been released back uh, to the university or indeed uh, most of the third years ha have now taken up uh, substantive staff nurse posts within our trust. Uh, and so this paper uh, can't really be compared to the data that would be um, uh, seen in previous papers nor in the paper that will follow uh, in the new year. Uh, it is really just a statement so that we have some assurance that we were allocating our, our staff appropriately. Uh, and I would ask uh, Trust Board to acknowledge that. Um, there will be uh, the new paper uh, of the staffing review uh, in the new year. Uh, and again, that'll look slightly different because we will have a very different skill mix given that we have a large number of qualified nursing associates uh, that will be in place by the time that review takes place. I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thanks, David. I have got nobody indicated questions at this point. Anybody any questions for David Miller? No. The no, yeah. Uh, thank, you, thank you for that report, David. Um, the paragraph under the table, I've read it many times, and I'm struggling to understand the difference between a vacancy and an unavailability. Yeah. So um, it, it, is, it is simply posts that uh, do not have, we, we need to recruit into those posts. Unavailability will be uh, um, people who may be uh, shielding and then not available for work. Either they are outside of the, the organization or they have to be they have to be deployed to non-clinical roles um, or staff who just weren't available for their shift for whatever reason that may be. Okay, but they were so, part of the payroll. Okay, so that the the unavailability of 31% is quite significant. Absolutely, absolutely. And that was one of the, the reasons um the, the national guidance came out around how we were going to be better uh, to be able to support the critical care areas also acknowledging that part of our workforce wasn't going to be available yeah okay and a secondary question then is um many many nurses aren't working on their home wards because we've closed wards we've we've spread people around um it's it's stressful it's tiring yeah. And I guess so my question is when we model staffing, are we taking into account that people are tired and stretched and in unfamiliar environments? Uh, yes, we are. Um, I think that um, if we had had more time to prepare for what we, we went into, we would have done things differently. And I think we, we um, I, I certainly personally acknowledge that uh, had we have had the opportunity or perhaps even the foresight, we would have given a lot more psychological preparation uh, to people uh, for moving from area to area. Uh, I think Parry mentioned earlier on that the sort of the, the, the enthusiasm and the, the approach of everybody wanting to make this, wanting us to be successful and wanting to, to make it OK for patients and staff really carried us in. But I think that was to the neglect sometimes of, of preparing our staff, both psychologically and we've received feedback now around people being cautious about if there is a second wave or a need to further reorganise our services, uh, how we would perhaps uh, skill those staff up differently and perhaps over a longer period of time to uh, know their clinical skills uh, in a little bit more detail. 
I think those things as well as looking at staffing and thinking about the skills mix and the different roles so that people get their breaks etc is going to be a really absolutely important. absolutely yeah. I, I, and there was I don't think I think we all we all appreciated that um, the use of PPE at all times was going to it was going to put delays in it was going to be uncomfortable but I don't think anyone really anticipated just what a physical and psychological burden that was going to be to frontline colleagues mm -hmm. to wear that and provide care for very unwell patients and perhaps do that in an unfamiliar surrounding and have their rest of their lives disrupted as well uh, and how we we could and should um, uh, look to support people differently in the future. Thank you. Um, I don't have any other questions. I just want to draw board members' attention. No, no more questions. Uh, board members' attention to the recommendation on page three of David's report about supporting the staffing recommendations approved by divisions. Um, and I think that goes without saying, David. I think we'll support it. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much for that report. Um, and then we move on to maternity incentive scheme, the August 2020 report. Trudy. Thanks Sorry. very much, Keith. Sorry, I was just getting all myself right. all the mutes turned back on. So this is the maternity incentive paper that's received regularly at board as part of the CNST requirements. Um, there's a, not a lot of detail to add to the paper because we're really familiar with this now and we've been successful in um, previous years. There's a, a question about getting support on Safety Action 4, which is narrated within, within the report and is aligned to the training um, um, questionnaire, which we discussed briefly earlier and Karen circulated information on that as one of the actions. And Karen and I discussed this yesterday and we are happy to uh, approve this and we're just seeking board approval to be able to submit. We're happy to approve that particular point. Yeah. Thank you. And that's it, Trudy, carry on. Um, and there's nothing else for me to say. I think the only thing I would want to raise is just to highlight to board colleagues that on the um, summary on page two, just to be aware of the highest risk to compliance. And we've recently been recruiting consultants, some fantastic candidates for consultants within obstetrics and gynaecology. And so that additional capacity as it comes on stream this autumn and I think early 2021, I think would be very welcome, coupled with the, the organisation's maternity strategy. So we just need to bear that in mind. So we receive that report, we've approved at point four, which we were asked to do. I don't think we're actually asked to approve anything else. So there we are. Thank you on that. Uh, Martin, uh, and go back for David. So, David Fossil. Thanks, David. Just on, I may have missed this somewhere, but on page seven, we make reference to the maternity staffing business case uh, being presented to the board in September. It was presented to execs on Monday and supported. Okay, so if that was execs rather than the full board, then yes, it was. That, just as we said, not in today's papers, that's why I was raising. Yeah, okay. yeah no, apologies, it's meant to say execs, the executive team have supported that business case. Thank you. And um, we'll continue to receive monthly updates on progress with the CNST program. It states here. Right, uh, with apologies, as I said earlier, we need to go back to item 1.10, which is just a verbal <coughs> update from the chief exec on COVID 19 and research. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, there, there's, yes, I could talk for a long time more, I could talk for a little bit, but, uh, but uh, as of yesterday, I haven't checked today's figures yet, they probably come in while uh, we've been um, in our meeting. Uh, we had just six um, COVID positive patients uh, yesterday, one of whom uh, was on a ventilator in intensive care. Uh, you know, and, as the board will know, from the discussions this morning, indeed, you know, the, the huge emphasis is really on on trying to uh, 
get the maximum amount of non-COVID uh, patients um, and clinical work carried out, both outpatients, diagnostics and elective surgery. As I've previously briefed the board before, you know, this is seriously complicated and, uh, and I think we, I think most trusts are finding this, you know, very challenging. I think for the month of August, um, the, the trust on average um, had proportionately done the most non the most planned work um, of acute trusts in West Yorkshire, uh, which, which is pleasing, but even then, you know, typically our average was about 73% of the same period uh, last year. So there, there is still a lot to do if we are to uh, meet the ask of NHS England stroke improvement of getting to 100% of outpatient activity in September and 90% of surgery activity. And whilst you know the driving force is really our collective desire to reduce waiting times for patients, you know this cannot be at the expense of the health and well-being of our staff. Because if our staff, you know, go under under this uh, under the ask, they they won't be in a fit state to look after. Uh, patients. So it, it, there is a, a real balance to be struck here about what is the art of the possible, uh, taking all things into account. Um, I was on a, a regional call uh, yesterday, tea time, uh, with Trudy, and um, I, I made uh, some suggestions that uh, national policy could change, or an ask really, of national policy changing that would enable, increase our capacity without putting uh, more pressure on staff by relaxing a couple of the um, constraints that we're all impacted by at the moment. Uh, so we, we will see, you know, where where this ends up. So I'm, you know, my, my view is that the outpatient volume of activity will continue to increase. I think the challenge is um, some of the radiology uh, capacity and um, and some of the planned surgery capacity. Now, I think it's hard to see how we're going to get back to 100% um, from October. But we, we are, everybody is doing their best to uh, get some of the constraints and blockages resolved uh, where possible. Thank you, Martin. Any questions for Martin on that report? Very brief update. I think we all recognise the efforts and the endeavours of everybody in the trust to drive things forward and get back to whatever the new normal is um, and recognise how challenging the times are, Martin. It isn't easy. I don't think anybody in this meeting has um, got any comments to add. And then we can move on to the comment. Out. But no, thank you for that. So that concludes the board meeting. I've not had any other business notified to me of a formal nature. Our next meeting in public of the Trust Board will be on Thursday, 12th November 2020 at 9 a.m. And this meeting again, we expect, will be held by Microsoft Teams Live. So my thank you to all who've attended and members of the public. Before we go, I just want to say, and I said earlier, we want to thank Lenore Ogilvy, who leaves the board at the end of this month um, as she moves to Canada. Um, so Lenore, thank, I think I said this from Friday Quarter Committee, and sorry if it's a repeat and you see it on the loop, Channel 4 plus 1 almost, but thank you very much for all you've done as a board member. She disappeared, she's probably put her camera off. So thank you for all you've done as a board member. I think, as I said on Friday, you've been an absolute class act as a Tier 1 uh, Chair of the Quality Committee and as a board member. You've made a major contribution to the board in, in all sorts of ways, but particularly I think one of the things which you will be 
remembered for is that you've been in, not exactly on baking cakes, uh, which is a tradition <laughs> that I think will wither the vine with your departure. But who knows? Someone, maybe a successor, maybe even a new quality chair, though he said he would, will grasp that metal. <laughs> but uh, joking aside, thank you very much on behalf of all of us for all you've done. Um, I would like to give you a small present token of our appreciation as a colleague, but that will be done in a socially distant way as we talked about last week. Um, and we, you know, we'll have a further conversation with that, about that at some point. I know you're sort of isolating at the moment before you trip to Canada next week, um, and then you'll be self-isolating when you arrive in Victoria. Um, but I'm delighted that you'll still be joining colleagues at our seminar on the 24th of September, and I do salute your fortitude and bravery for getting up at that time in the morning. Um, so thank you very much indeed. For all <coughs> I think a number of people are putting thumbs up to yep. say thank you as well. Thank you. And, uh, can I just say one thing? You're keeping your private email address because some people I think have that and so they can communicate with you post uh, your departure because your NHS address will go, won't it? Yes, it will. And, I, and I'd be very happy to stay in touch with colleagues. Can I just say my thank you to the board um, from the first time I joined the board as part of uh, a mentorship programme everyone demonstrated the values of the trust and and that demonstration of the values was really what encouraged me to want to apply to become an aid of the trust um i think what the board achieved in the last four years is amazing i think what the staff have demonstrated they can do is amazing and i really look forward to seeing the trust achieve good and outstanding i'll be toasting you from the other side of the world thank you everyone so a number of comments from loads of people to say thank you. You'll see that in the chat. I think the most important comment is made by the Director of Nursing, which is says, give the best <laughs> people the cupcakes to David Trussell. And that, I think, is very important. If you want his email address, please contact us. He's willing and able. Second that motion, Chair, right? Second that. <laughs> exactly. I think that he's a very busy man, as always, and I think Baker's not his core skill. He is managing to type, though, quite rapidly, so I'm going to get some comments shortly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Thank you very much um, for your meeting today. We'll be changing to fruit. Oh, no. Yeah, there speaks a doctor, isn't it? Let's bring the help in, yeah. We'll all be in diets of kale smoothies and stuff like that. Maybe we'll have fruitcake, David. That's the answer. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, the one thing Lenore didn't make me do was on Friday, I think she brought some cakes to the, uh, she brought some cookies. And there were nuts in it, and I ate them. I mean, many of you know I don't eat nuts, but they were made in a way which didn't taste nothing. <laughs> so, thank you. And anyway, that concludes, that concludes the meeting. Library is effective, and there we are. Thank you very much. Oh, Cam Stone says boring, David. There's your medical colleague. You've been saying <laughs> right, ladies and gentlemen, we will reconvene in, in the next stage of the meeting in about 10 minutes, and thank you for that.